Welcome to Anxious Like You, a podcast hosted by Micheline Malouf and Nadia Adesi, two therapists who are anxious like you. In each episode, Micheline and Nadia dive into their guest's experience with anxiety and give you the tools you need to face your anxiety head on. This podcast is made in collaboration with Dive Through, a mental wellness company. Today, we are speaking with Christy Ote, a Chicago-based writer and essayist. She is the author of her memoir, Group, How a Therapist and a Group of Strangers Saved My Life, which was recently added to Reese Witherspoon's book club and is a New York Times bestseller. Christy opens up to us about growing up with an eating disorder, intrusive and suicidal thoughts, and depression, so let this serve as your trigger warning. Let's dive in. So today we have Christy Tate, and we're going to dive right in to questioning her. Um, So tell us a little bit about your mental health. Is it something that you've always struggled with, or was there something that triggered uh, mental health challenges in your life? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say I've struggled with it all my life, but I didn't have the language for it, and nobody around me was talking about mental health. I grew up in the 80s in Dallas, Texas, and the important things were being thin, being pretty, being happy, and the rest of it, you just were supposed to, the message I understood was like, stuff it down, and I think I, I had trouble with my food very early on, obsessive thoughts about food, body hating, I remember hating my body by third grade, and I was really into ballet, And, you know, that's a rough place to go. (laughs) If you're a fleshy little kid, ballet is not a very welcoming art form, not the where, not where I was doing it. And so I think that those were really troublesome areas for me. I began to be active in an eating disorder in seventh grade. I began purging. I'd seen it on TV and I was like, this is brilliant. (laughs) I mean, I watched the whole like after school special and understood it was bad, but it really just appealed to me because I was a sick person. And through high school, I, I guess I would call it depression. And just, I think if I'd had a place to go to talk about things, if it was part of the world I lived in or the zeitgeist to say, oh, maybe you're lonely, maybe you're depressed, maybe your high achievement is masking some soul sickness or or whatever language, if there was any language at all, but I just got really isolated. And so the, I mean, in some ways now I'm far enough in my recovery with my eating disorder that I can truly say at age 47, I'm glad it escalated the way that it did in college because it forced me to get help. And I got into a 12 step program when I was a sophomore in college, because I was scared I was going to die. I mean, you can die of bulimia. (laughs) And I was like, I'm going to die in the shower. So I think that's when I was 19 years old. And that's when I began to understand that for the rest of my life, I was going to have to prioritize mental health, whether the world did or not, I had to. So you said that from seventh grade is when you remember that, well, third grade, you remember seeing something on TV, then seventh grade is when it actually came to life, the eating disorder. That's when the purging started. And then in high school, all four years, also struggling with the eating disorder. Yeah, just all like sort of all over the board, which a lot of people who have eating disorders, like I could starve for periods and then I would be in binging and then I would be binging and purging and I'd be over exercising. It was sort of like a little, I had a little grab bag of um, tools for my disease. I wouldn't call them mental health tools. (laughs) They were, they were very Mm self-destructive and I had to let all of that at least start talking about it. I still, I wouldn't say like, I wasn't cured when I walked through the doors of an, a 12 step program. But when I was in college, I had to start talking about that and looking at that because I really, you know, somewhere inside the darkness got to me and I had to make a decision if I was going to live or die. And I'm really grateful that I got into a 12 step program and I really thought it would cure me in the sense of it was all I would ever need. I was hoping that's all I would ever need. And there, you know, as I went along in my life as a young adult through my twenties, I was definitely grateful to have the program and be dealing with my eating disorder. But I, I think probably two or three years in, probably I was in my young 21, I was starting to have relationships with men that were not 
going well. <laughs> they were not going well. Mm -hmm. And I was picking men who weren't a good fit for me for obvious reasons. They were so obvious, like they liked to party. I didn't drink. I wanted to have like go out to dinner and they wanted to stay home and drink. <laughs> it was a lot of drinking in them and not in me. And I was like watching myself pick these men and just fall head over heels. And I couldn't fix that in a 12 step program for eating disorder. And people were giving me their therapist number numbers for years, years. And I didn't believe in therapy because I didn't have the money. So I couldn't afford to believe in it because where was I going to get the money for that? And mm -hmm. I was a secretary and then I was, you know, so I had a lot of defenses about therapy, like a 12 step program should have done. I didn't have the money. It's for rich people. It's for people who are self-indulgent. It's for people with trust funds. I had all these ways of saying it's not for me. And then again, I had one of those moments where I can't wait till the day when I'm motivated just by sunshine and light. But I was in this case, again, I was really motivated to seek help again when I was in my twenties, because I started feeling like what's the point? What's the point of living? I'm going to be all alone. Maybe I don't binge and purge anymore, which is great, but I'm going to be all alone. And the prospect of that made me want to die. And that's not normal. I knew enough to know that wasn't normal. I still wasn't in an atmosphere. It, maybe it wasn't in the zeitgeist or I was pretty isolated. So maybe somewhere people were talking about mental health, but I wasn't. And then I was, I was motivated. So that was like age 27 to get into therapy and to really just like let it all hang out, not just settle for having, not binging and purging wasn't enough. There were things I wanted in my life. I didn't know how to get, and I was sad and ashamed about not having them. And I just needed more help. And that's how I ended up in group. So wow. what was the actual moment when it was, okay, I need to go to this group now? Yeah. So I had, it was one of those moments where the insides, my insides and my outsides of my life were so incongruent that I felt like my head was going to explode. I was a first year law student. I had just finished my first year of law school and I went up to school and you could get your class rank. And I got a little card that said I was first in my class. And I was like, yes, like fist pumping. I'm fist pumping the bursar. <laughs> I give her back the little card that tells me then I take the elevator down to the street and I'm in the street waiting to go walk to the train. And I'm like, that's it. That's it. I can do tests. I can be really, really good on paper, but inside I'm so alone. I want to die. What is this? What, like, what is this? I had no one to talk to and no one to tell. I didn't want to be braggy about my class rank. Plus who was going to understand? I have this awesome professional future ahead of me. But inside, I'd watch myself pick alcoholic man, drug addict man. I was all alone. I didn't know how to have friends or stay in touch with college friends or even talk to my family. And I wanted to die. And it was that moment holding that card and feeling like I should be so thoroughly happy. But in the back of my mind going, I should kill myself. That's so messed up. That's when I was like, I need help. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that, you know, as young as three years old, you were really struggling with your mental health. What was going on in your world that, uh, you know, that young, you felt like stuff was off. You weren't feeling well. Yeah, I think I just remember, I remember being really, really young and I remember being in the backseat of my mom's car and looking at my legs and thinking they're so fat. Like, I, I feel like that was preschool and I remember battling food I remember in pre like I was very much the type of child who was like really perfect like I wanted all the affirmation I wanted my teachers to love me the most and I was like such a good girl I wanted to be smart and obedient and get all of the rewards of that and I remember in kindergarten so I was five years old I got in trouble one time and I had to sit in Miss Hunter's thinking chair, which is the punishment. What I'd done is I'd stolen a cookie. They're, like you had to go to these stations and I'd already been at the cookie station, but I snuck back and I took a cookie, another one, which is like, so that's like how pulled I was to food. I think it might've been a graham cracker, not even a cookie. And um, somebody told on me, it was like, Christy stole a cookie. Then I lied. So I got two troubles, <laughs> like two 
And I just remember the pull, like I knew better, I knew better than to steal. It wasn't my turn, et cetera. But I was so compelled by food and I wanted it to numb out. Like I wouldn't have used those words at age five, but even looking back, I was like, there's something off about me and my relationships to people, to approval and to food. And it was all jumbled up inside me. You actually mentioned the word perfectionism. And I feel like this is all kind of connected. You're controlling the food area of your life. You're controlling the relationships. You're the top of your class. So yeah. finding some sense of comfort and things you can control. But then as soon as it's like, oh, I'm having these suicidal thoughts, I can't yeah. control these. That's when everything is kind of put into perspective of I need to get some support. Oh, a hundred percent. I think for me, perfectionism, that's such a tricky drug. That's such a tricky drug. There's so much outside approval. Teachers did love me and I have an awesome resume to show for it. And there's the American work ethic and there's the puritanical work ethic. And I grew up Catholic. And so there's so many ways that perfectionism is rewarded. But the truth is I used it as a cover for all the mess I felt was inside of me when really what was inside of me was just normal feelings. Sometimes I was lonely. Sometimes I was angry. I was jealous of my little sister. I was jealous of my brother. Like those are all normal things, but because I just stuffed that all down, I needed food to help me keep it all down. And then I just went on my way studying for algebra, working on science fair and like the prospect of getting a B for example, I, the, the, when I first got into my 12 step program, sophomore year, I had of college, I had fainted in the shower, which was really scary. And I had been binging and purging, fainted in the shower. I was like, oh my God, like, I'm going to be like that woman who was in that, some rock band and she died of anorexia, even though it's not what I was doing, binging and purging. But what really upset me was I was about to get a B in a women's studies class. And I was an English major. And I was like, that's, that's when I knew how far I had fallen, that I was going to get a B and I just almost didn't care. I was so sick. I didn't care. And the perfectionism was crumbling around me. It wasn't enough to keep me, to hold me together. And it never should have been. Sorry, Nadia. Yeah, um, so it sounds like, it sounds like your value of your, your self-worth and your value was wrapped around what other people thought of you and the success and the, the, the pressure that was placed on you? A hundred percent. The other function of perfectionism and external was that I had no idea what I wanted. I had no idea what I really even thought about anything. I, it was like, I went into every situation and I had a very, I had a somewhat simple life. So it wasn't like I was in complex situations. I was like in college, talking to my roommates, going to class, whatever. And every situation I was like, well, what do you want me to think? Like, what does the professor want? Give the professor. What do these fraternity boys want? Give them what you can. What does my roommate want? And so there was like no, there was no sense of my own desire or dreams. It was just like, follow the next. Like I've even heard Michelle Obama when in her documentary about her book, she just talks about chicken, checking off the boxes, graduate school, check, law school, check. And it's like, where in there was, I didn't have passion. I didn't have, I, I had per, perfectionism was a mass that kept me from finding passion and purpose and true relationships. And I feel like so, so grateful I was able to break that. And I wish I hadn't carried that forward as a way of being for as long as I did. Right. And so you mentioned that you're somebody who pushes a lot of things down. And then right now you mentioned that you're somebody who isn't, wasn't really able to figure out their own passion, their own goals. It was always what other people wanted. And now you're going into group therapy, forced to do all this uncomfortable work that you've been avoiding for years. How was that process? Oh my God. It was so messy. It was so messy. And thank God nobody told me how messy it was going to be to the way that my editor uh, for the book described it was like to get emotionally naked. And I was like, oh, that's so what it was. It just makes you go, ooh, like to have to go to this group. There's other people there. They were all ahead of me. They just been there longer, whatever that means. And they knew how to do it. And, and even just questions like, in my, even before I got in a, into group, 
the therapist saw me three times as a screening. And he said to me in that first 45 minutes, he said to me probably five times, what do you want? And I was like, I want to not die alone. And then he would talk a little bit and then he'd say, what, what else? What do you want? And I was like, that's it. That's it, dude. Get me a hygienic boyfriend and a couple of friends so I don't die alone. We're done here. And he's like, what about your career? I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. I do not care. And he was like, that seems crazy. You are the top of your law, law school. You must care about this. I was like, I don't. I don't think I do. And so when I got to group, he was on alert that I was sort of a shell of a woman. <laughs> and to be encouraged and supported in finding out what's in here. What is Christy? What do I, what do I, maybe I don't give a shit about the law. Sorry, I don't know how I'm allowed to guess. <laughs> um, maybe I don't, maybe, maybe I want to relax. Like one of the biggest things I had to learn how to do was just like relax, like on a Sunday afternoon. Like I think one of my early prescriptions in group was to just spend a few hours on the couch, like what's like surfing TV. We didn't have Netflix then. And I was just like, eh, I'm going to feel so gross <laughs> and purposeful and, and fat, you know, like there's no correlation there, but that was just how, how jumbled up I was in my head and how tightly wound I was. And I, I had, you know, society wants me like that because I made a really good worker and I didn't make any waves. But that's not good for me personally. What were you afraid would happen if you slowed down? Oh yeah, that's such a good question. I think what I, what I would have told you I was afraid of is feeling lazy. And what I think I meant by that was what I know now, and I still struggle with slowing down, when I slow down, like I breathe, I lay on the bed, not even just to go to sleep, just to like have a moment, I start to have feelings. And they're not even all bad feelings. Like sometimes it's, I'm, sometimes I lay down in the middle of the day and I'm flooded with gratitude. And I think to myself, why would I run from gratitude? That's the most wholehearted thing. That's what Oprah's been telling us to do for years. And I'm like, but there's something about stopping to feel I think I feel out of control. I don't know what's going to come up. If I am still, I kind of don't know what's going to happen. But if I keep going and I'm like, to-do list, blah, make this phone call, make this appointment, so-and-so's got a birthday, da, 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 do the work. Like if I do all that, then I don't have to feel whatever it is, joy, resentment, gratitude, fatigue. Um, and I don't like not being in control. So feelings are scary for a lot of people. And uh, slowing down from a perfectionistic lifestyle, that's, that's one of the, the things that a lot of people talk about being one of the scariest things ever. It's just, what do I do with these feelings? Even if they're good, because we just don't know what to do with them. And in your book, you talk about going to law school. And yes, you had motivation you know, for advocacy and all of that, but really the tr truth behind that was that it was acceptable to work a 60 or 70 hour work week and that you could work holidays and that would mean that you had less time to feel how did you come to that realization i think deep I, I think not even deep down i think on some level i knew that okay i was sitting at my desk my secretary does my dead-end job i have a i had a master's degree and i was at the most dead-end job i was so bored i was like Hmm. And, and I had a relationship that had just tanked another one. And I was like, okay, well, I suck at relationships. So that's off the table. Like, I'm not going to become a person who's going to, I didn't, I didn't know anything inside of me was capable of doing a relationship. So I'm like, well, I need to pick something. I need something to do that will absorb like all my free time. And I consciously picked law because my calculus was, okay, I'm going to suck at relationships and that's sad. And I'll probably always be sort of sad about that, but I will have this baller career. I'll have social power. I will have money and I will have awesome purses. <laughs> I was just like, I was really into these purses. I don't even know what, like <laughs> what I meant by that. Like, I'm not, I just knew that like, even if I, whatever was happening with my body, I could always buy a nice purse and I could signal to the world, nobody wants to be with me or I can't do a marriage, 
check out my purse, please. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that's the very, I mean, it sounds really shallow, but like the law was always in my mind, a consolation prize. I knew I was bright and I didn't know what to do with it. And my loneliness seemed to be a problem. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just channel this into law and I'll hit two of the things I want, which is money and power and a career. So I guess that's three. And then everything else, I'll hopefully be too busy to miss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds like wanting acceptance again from the world rather than, you know, totally to like yeah. I had so much shame about who I was that I was like, well, it was like this balancing act, you know, like mm -hmm. I won't be, a, I won't have like cute kids with like little bows and sailor suits but you know, I'll be on Christmas Eve, I'm closing a deal. Like, I didn't even know what kind of law, law that was, but I was going to be doing it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what changed? What changed? Well, when I got to group, it became a 90 minute session once a week where I couldn't run anymore, where no one, no one cared about my resume they wanted to know what they wanted to be up under that with me and they wanted to know okay like we don't care how great you did on your sub pro exam we want to know what you like to eat and I was like that was one of the first questions like tell the group what you ate and I was like oh no 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 like something so basic that today I could rattle off but at the time I had food secrets I was still ashamed and I was like, I can't do this. And then there was one, tell the group, you know, like what you like, what, what brings you pleasure in your body, which is like super personal. And there were men in the group. And I was just like, it wasn't that I knew and wasn't telling them. It was that I had no idea. And when to be that exposed in my own self ignorance in front of other people, who were there to help me meet myself, it's sort of like, it showed me that because they believed and the doctor, Dr. Rosen, because they believed, it sort of made a little space between me and my conviction that I could never have anything. I could never have a relationship. It made some space because I could look around the room and see their belief. And they, I, they told me if I kept coming and doing this very uncomfortable work, my life would change. And it started to change because I let out my secrets and I was able to let go of this narrative I had just grasped onto. I get to be a lawyer and nothing else. Mm -hmm. What helped you on that journey of self-discovering? As you mentioned, I had no idea what I liked. What helped you start discovering what you did like? What helped me is listening to other people tell me not even what they necessarily liked, but how they figured it out. And I was very, very repressed, but some of the early suggestions were, why don't you take a bath? And then somebody would say, why don't you buy yourself some really nice lavender gel to have in a bath? And I was like, I mean, I bought like Dove bars that were on sale. Nothing wrong, with, not, the can not the ice cream, the soap. <laughs> <laughs> that would be better. That's <laughs> like, fine. <laughs> I just, yeah, I just bought like the generic. I just was like very generic. And I remember somebody said, Well, why don't, do you cook for yourself? And I did cook for myself because I was very, very cheap and scared of eating out because, oh my God, what's in the food? And I was so controlling. And I made like, there was like two meals I made for myself. And I remember someone in group said to me, I don't even know why she asked this, but like, what kind of a pan do you have? I'm like, pan what we're talking about pans and therapy like I want a boyfriend why are we talking about pans and I had no idea what I had inherited some castaway pans that my mom had given me when she, my mom upgraded to some stainless steel so I had the ones that she got when she got married and this was and I was 30 years old at the time so these are 30 year old pans like and and the group just went bananas like buy yourself some pans and I could not tell you I was furious. I was like, no, I wanted to be out dating and buying lingerie. And they were like sending me off to buy a skillet. Like why? But I was so basic. I needed to start with some basics. How do I feed myself? What do I use to feed myself? 
What kind of a priority is it? How do you take a bath? What could you do to make it more sensual or luxurious or self-care-y? Self-care wasn't even like a huge thing then, but what helped me was listening, but I couldn't listen until I exposed myself. I had to expose what I was doing. And the pan thing I just walked into, because I was, it wasn't even on my radar. Like people were buying things. I'd never stepped foot in crate and barrel. Like why would I go in there? You know, I had a pan, I had a spatula, I had a, I had a pasta thing and a skillet and a spatula. I'm like, what else do I need? And then somebody was like, how about a colander? <laughs> I was like, that's fancy. You know, meanwhile, I'm making six figures as a lawyer and I don't even know the basics, the very basics of feeding myself. If you can't feed mm-hmm. yourself, what kind of a relationship that I think I was going to be having? I had to start at home in the kitchen and then move out from there. It's taking those baby steps. It's something that we tell everybody. It's like, get to know yourself first, get to figure out what you like, get to know, because especially when from hearing your story, I'm hearing that your whole life, you, you were trying to please other people and live for other people and make a name for yourself. And not only for your, not for yourself, for others, you wanted other people to think highly of you. So of course you shut yourself down. And so this process as simple as it might seem, it's like, okay, go buy yourself some nice pans and cook for yourself. It does. It has such a huge impact Yeah. on your life. Yeah. And then I think there were once I, once I learned how to take suggestions and not even just like, not even like do what people tell me, but to hear what people were saying and what they were offering, like, like, do you ever eat with other people? And at this point in my life, I sometimes ate lunch with other people at law school, but I brought my own food and I was like really weird about it. But like at night I didn't, I just ate by myself. I watched TV and I went to bed and I did it all the next day and just letting other people into my life and seeing what they do, going to places where they go and letting people into my life helps me understand. There were things I didn't like, but there was like a whole, whole spectrum of the world that I just was shut off from. And so how did I know what I didn't or didn't like? Cause I kept things so, so small. So yeah, mm-hmm. so incredibly interesting. When was the decision to write a book about group? Yeah, that's, um, that came later <laughs> like, <Okay. laughs> after I had a husband and I had my kids and I was sort of like, became interested in writing. I mean, that's something that didn't pop up like a passion that I feel for writing, I was in my thirties and that's late, you know? And like, that's one thing I try not to have regrets, of course, because I'm grateful for everything in my life and every step I took led me here. But it would have been nice to know when I was a little bit young, I could have studied writing. I could have gone and done things a little more complex now because I have a family and they need braces. And like, it's just harder to, follow the, it's not impossible, but it's different. And so I had been writing and talking about it in my group and in my mental health spaces. And I was trying to write fiction because I thought, well, that's what you're supposed to write. Again, I was like, only famous people can write a true story. Like if you're Celine Dion or, you know, people want to read Michelle Obama, but they don't want to read, nobody knows me. And then somebody just said, why don't you tell the true story? because I kept writing stories about young, lonely lawyer girls <laughs> and their therapists <laughs> and they were getting real weird because I'm, I, I'm not very good at fiction. Um, but I think the truth is the real story wanted to pop out because I was meant to be telling the true story. And once I sort of like heard someone make the suggestion and it gave myself permission to write it, even though I'm not famous and I'm not a TikTok star or whatever, that wasn't a thing then when I started, but um, then I began to feel like, oh, this is a really, this, if I stick with this and if I tell this story, it could be compelling. First and foremost, I wanted to be compelling and entertaining. And it wasn't until I was done that I thought this might help somebody. I didn't write it to help people. I wrote it for my own expression. And because I, these, the, the stories seem unbelievable. The things that when I look back and I hear now that I'm more integrated, I hear other people's stories about therapy and they're like, my therapist suggested I go on match.com. I'm like, oh really? 
well, my therapist suggested I get a tattoo on my belly, you know? <laughs> so I, I started to see the potential in the story. Um, and then after it was done and we started talking about like putting it out into the world, I realized that it could, not that I think everyone should go to group therapy. I do not think that it's not for everybody, but I think conversations about mental health tools are for everybody. Absolutely. You talk a lot in your book about the, the thoughts of death that you would have, um, suicidal thoughts and, you know, just being, especially one that stuck out to me was the part where you're talking about finding out you're number one in your class and still like not wanting that extravagant life. So you'd prefer to die yeah. in that moment. So can you talk to us more about that? What were those thoughts like for you? I, it scared me. It really scared me. And, you know, there's, there's ways that I, I mean, I'm a sort of dramatic person, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm given to dramatics. And so, um, you know, I might've said something, oh, I'm so hot. I could die. Like, I don't talk like that now, but I think at the time I probably was, um, pretty shut off and might've used a metaphor of death. But this was different. This was the, I found out like on a Friday of a long weekend. And when you're lonely and it, it's your, when, when I was lonely, I was very single, very lonely. And there'd be these long weekends and I didn't know how to fill them. And I just would sit in my hot apartment and think it's the 4th of July. Everybody's out like watching the stars and the fireworks with their beloveds and they're eating awesome food and they're biking around eating popsicles and I'm just like sitting here like when's the next 12 step meeting starting and that was really lonely and difficult and so what was different was I had gotten up early in the morning to go buy fruits and vegetables and I just thought I want to drive through I want to I'm going to drive through the bad part of Chicago and I hope maybe a bullet will hit me and there was, it wasn't like, I wasn't talking to anybody. I wasn't dramatizing. I was like, oh my God, I think I, I think I want to die. There was just sort of like the monotone, the matter of factness with which I was like, God, maybe someone would shoot me. Wouldn't that be awesome? And that stopped me cold because that's different than tossing off a comment about wanting to die. And there was something about feeling like this will never end and never change. That was the, I guess that's the essence of depression, right? It's like this today and it will be like this forever. And if that was really true, I totally understand why somebody would make a very drastic decision about their life. As, as a therapist, often I find myself asking the question to my clients when they express suicidal ideation or thoughts, I always say, is it that you want to die or is it that you want the pain to end or want to live? What do you think is, where, where were you on that? On yeah, that I think that's a really important distinction. And I hope that people would ask that people do that. Mental health professionals are not. What I wanted, I definitely wanted the pain to end. But I think by that time, I think I'd gotten so far pushed into a corner, there was something about that number one, that no, what was so triggering about having achieved the spot of number one in law school was I, I, I pushed and pushed and pushed myself. And I worked so hard every single day. I, I didn't go out I, every Sunday and I could do it. I knew I could do it. I proved it. I did it. I was number one. I was smart enough and disciplined enough, masochistic enough, whatever. But I knew the things I truly wanted, I couldn't push. Like all the smarts and all the whatever I had that could get it on, get it in law school, that wasn't good. I didn't even know where or how to push to get the things I truly wanted. And that made me want to, I felt a lot of pain and shame about that. And I definitely wanted that to end. But because I had slipped and felt so hopeless, I don't know that I could have distinguished the difference between I want the pain to end and I want to end my life. I think it, I just, it had fused pretty concretely and it would have taken, a, it took a while to un, unwind all of that. 
Yeah. Sometimes it's difficult to find that distinction. One of the quotes you made that me and Micheline were talking about before was you wanted to drive through the neighborhood and get shot and it would be luck, but depending on how you look at it, it would be good luck or bad luck. And that was just such an interesting perspective to put it in based on you going through it and then people on the outside right, watching you go through it. It's such, like two completely different outlooks. Yeah, I definitely recognized, I mean, not at the time, but looking back when I was trying to write the pain of that, there was a huge passivity. I, I did not have a plan. You know, I know now, like when they, we've done as a lawyer, they sometimes do mental health training and they sort of, you know, do you have a plan? Do you have a method? I had a date. I had none of that. I just had searing pain that I couldn't see around and I couldn't imagine how to get around it. It seemed just my life. And so I think the case is I wanted to end the pain, but didn't know how to distinguish the pain from my life. Can you paint us a picture of what that pain looked like for you? Yeah, I would say it was the, just that it's like stuckness, just like, like I felt like I was in a straight jacket and because that's how I felt the whole world looked like that. Right. It was a really hot summer. This, I was like, I call that my bottom. So this was July and I lived in an unair conditioned apartment. Now I had a lot of choices about how I could have handled that. I could have, Oh, I actually bought, I had a window unit, which does plenty. It does get you farther, but I didn't know how to install it. And so I just sat on the floor and that was like a, such a great metaphor. I had a way to feel better, but because I didn't ask for help. And I, it's like almost like I was really, really stupid when it came to myself. Like I would go to work and I'd bust balls all day and I was doing great. And I would come home and I'd be like, I don't know what to do about this. And I'm just dripping with sweat. The air is not moving in my apartment. I could have called a friend. I could have called a neighbor. I could have called the landlord. I could have called my parents. There were so many ways. I went to 12 step meetings. People there could have like come, could you help me? Could you call me? Could you show me? There were so many choices. I couldn't see any of them. And so that, what that felt like, so I felt stuck. Like I could hardly breathe, right? This this hot stuck air. That's how my apartment felt. And then I get on the train rush hour. That's how the train felt. And then it just started to seem like this is the world. This isn't a consequence of choices I'm making. This is how it is. And I'm accurately perceiving the world, which of course is not true. I was not accurately perceiving the world. I was very stuck. And it was like, it was just like a humid, jaundiced, straight jacket and just could barely take a full breath and just nothing lush nothing, no breezes, no no horizons, just unending stuckness. Wow. Really painted a picture for us. Like (laughs) I really feel it. Yeah. With With therapy and with group therapy, there's usually two different options. Sometimes there's those big aha moments and you're like, okay, now change is happening. Other times it's like months go by and you look back and you think, wow, okay, there's been progress. Maybe I haven't noticed it as much weekly to week, but when I look back, there's so much that's happened. Did you fall somewhere in between? Did you have any of those big moments or was it looking back on your progress? I think I had, luck. I've been there long enough that I've had both. And I think, I, I appreciate that I've had a combination. I think in that first time when I was invited to share with the group what I had eaten the day before, I knew that was a, that was a pivotal moment in my life because I had never done that. I'd had food secrets since going way, like back to age three, at the time I was 27. That's a long time to carry around secrets. And it was, it was my first time doing the most terrifying thing I could have imagined. It would have been less frightening, I think, if you would have said, take your shirt off. Um, I'd have had a whole other set of issues, but it would have been less <laughs> frightening personally for all the shame I carried. So that was like a lightning bolt because once I was through the exercise and had told everyone and they didn't shun me or shame me or act like I was beyond repair because I had some quirky food things happening. And then there were other times when I would 
I would report back, I'd be in a relationship that wasn't great in therapy. And I would report, you know, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. And it wasn't horrifyingly just heart ripped out breakup, just like kind of letting things run their course. I would feel like, oh, I, I might be growing up. I might be maturing. I might be learning how to let go. And those were quieter moments that I would see when I was ready to let go. So I've had, I would, de I've definitely had a combo. I think I love the bright, that those bolt moments, they're so like dazzling and they're, they're sexier and they're easier to describe, but the other ones, they're a real foundation as well. Yeah. Nadia was actually telling me about a podcast that she was listening to where you mentioned that you watched somebody die on the beach at a young age. And she was telling me that at the beginning, because that's a story that I experienced personally as well. And oh, so, no. so I, I was like, oh my gosh, this is something to talk about because recently as well, even as a therapist, realizing how it's impacting my life now and with the fear of loved ones dying and like that unprocessed trauma. And I'm wondering how has that impacted you? And do you notice that kind of weaving itself into your life currently? I do. I really do. And thank you for sharing about your own experience. That's really super meaningful to me. Out of all these conversations I've had, nobody has said I've had that experience. And so that really touches me. Um, I do. I feel like I am a person who now in every situation, I'm some part of me for some split second imagines who could die and how. And I mean, I do it every single day. And just today we're having a big snowstorm in Chicago and I was looking out the window and my husband was like shoveling snow. Now he's very fit, 47 year old shoveling and he's not, it's not. And I was like, huh, if he slipped under the ice and that somebody ran him over, what would, you know, what would I do? And it's a, it's a split second. It doesn't stop me. I was cutting pineapple for the kids. I, I recognize that I have that all the time. And I, I believe that comes from my experience of being on this lush, beautiful vacation, thinking without a care in the world, other than I wished my body was smaller. I mean, that was my big problem at age, when I was 13 with 12 when it happened, 13, 13. Mm -hmm. And um, just having normal adolescent worries and an eating disorder, but nothing like death is coming in Hawaii. Um, so I do recognize that. And I do think that there's a, sometimes I think, well, that's made me really morbid. And that's certainly one way to look at it. I was, the other day I was running upstairs because um, my kids were doing school downstairs and my husband had some snacks upstairs. I need a snack. And I'm like, I'm just gonna pop some peanuts in my mouth and I'll come back down and do it. And I was like, what if I choked on the peanut and then I, I, I and they find me on the floor. I don't think that's totally normal. <laughs> Like this is like, I literally do it every day. And yeah. part of me thinks like, I heard Jerry Seinfeld talk on a podcast and he was talking about his own depression. And it's like part of his kit. He's funny. He's made a living in comedy better than most. And he's also depressed. And it's, you can't have one without the other. It's just part of the kit of who he is. And I really like that non-shaming way to think about it. I'm like, part of my kit is I have a real appreciation that death could come at any moment it really just could come at any moment and while my adult brain knows me running upstairs to get a handful of peanuts is not the same as like diving into surf where you're not supposed to be is two different things but I've kind of made peace with it in the sense of could it be like a superpower could it be a way in which I value life. I va I'm really happy. At the end of the day, it sounds super morbid. I'm like, everybody's alive. I'm so grateful. I love you all so much. Everybody's here. Everybody's alive. Like, I have an overactive like nervous system around loss, but it's not all bad. It's made me very sensitive, and I can't stop it anyway. I'm in there before we talk about it a lot. Um, I do think sometimes like my kids are getting older. So when they get invited to go do things where I'm not there, like vigilantly, like standing on the water's edge with my binoculars, like if they want to go with their friends, like they've never really been swimming without me. 
and that mm -hmm. we can't sustain that. So I don't know what happens. I don't know how that's going to go. It's my job to carry that, not theirs. So I hope, my hope is I don't hold them back and that my husband, my husband helps me let them go and do what they need to do in the world, but it's going to suck. <laughs> I'm not looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just so, it's so, it, it, it's something we don't look at as like a big deal, but it is because that same experience that you're describing, it's like in the split of second, you know, somebody could go. And that's been my experience too. Like I over, there was a story that I shared where my husband was late coming home from work for like 30 minutes and I was calling like the hospitals all around and, you know, and, and it's, you know, with the pandemic, you know, having my parents go out into the world grocery shopping or something yep. they have to do work. And you're thinking just visually seeing them sick or something happening to them. And it's so scary. How are you, are you, I don't even, are you in therapy right now or how are you working on that? Yeah, I am in therapy. I still go to group. We're Zooming because it's not in person. It's been almost a year. Um, and I definitely work on that. And I definitely, I've kind of resigned from the debate. I think early on, I've seen people do this too. It's like, well, I don't have PTSD. I'm not a Vietnam vet. Like that's something that they reserve. And I think I did this too early on. Like PTSD is for someone who's been horribly abused been to war like I saw one man drown does that qualify I just resigned from that debate and I accept there's trauma written into my being and um, the question is what do I do about it and I take those fears to therapy and I talk about them what I like about group is that there's six other people there who also have trauma their traumas don't, don't look like mine but they're working through them too and they come in all different flavors. And I've learned a lot about trauma. I've learned like poverty is trauma and being mm -hmm. smacked by your parent is a trauma. Like, there's so many traumas or immigration. There's people oh, in my yeah. group who've had really traumatic immigration experiences. And that's totally not my experience, but to watch people, to get well with other people and also to understand my definition of getting well does not mean I never feel afraid or that I don't think I'm taking a beach vacation anytime soon. I mean, COVID notwithstanding, but like, I just don't know that that's totally my, I want to go to the mountains. <laughs> I don't want to go to the beach mm -hmm. um, and I don't have to. And that doesn't mean I'm not well. I can honor my limits and honor my experience and my history. And the fact that this comes up for me, um, it just means I get to look at it and ask for help and slow down, like just slow down. When my kids first went to summer camp, there was a swimming component and my kids didn't know how to swim. And I was just like sweating. And they're telling us about, it. I'm like sweating. <laughs> like, no, I'm like grabbing my husband's arm. Like, no. And I was like, go ask him if anyone's ever died. And he was like, no. Um, and what I did was I, there was another mother who was also really, really scared. And she was asking, she and I both were just, our hands were shooting up. What about this? What about that? Blah, blah, blah. And how many people? What's the ratio? And afterwards I went to talk to her and I'm like, I'm so scared. And she was like, I am too. And we didn't say why. I don't know why she was scared. She doesn't know why I was, but I immediately felt better. And I'm like, well, maybe we should go talk to the director and just um, let them reassure us. And we did. We both went to talk to the director and he explained it. It helped. It, it, no amount of information is going to make my nervous system think yeah my baby people don't drown because I know that they do mm -hmm. um, but then I went and saw it and I got comfortable and it's just messy it's messy I wish it weren't it, but I'm like but I made a friend with that mother and the director knows me now <laughs> um yeah I was, I was, I'm kind but like he needs yeah. to know you've got a psycho mom on your hands and I have good reason. <laughs> and please take care of me. And then when I went there, I saw that they really were doing a good job. I mean, most places are doing a very good job. So, but there's no, yeah. there is no zero fear. 
No. And I think this in itself is such an important message for our listeners because me and Micheline and I always get, is this trauma? Is what I went through trauma? Can you define trauma? And when I was listening to you on the other podcast, you were saying that you wouldn't accept it as your trauma because it wasn't your dad. And it wasn't like yeah. you were still able to go home. You were still able to see your dad, but then you notice on the anniversary or years later it was coming yeah. up, it's impacting your life. It's impacting relationships. It's impacting family. And yeah. that's kind of when you know, okay, this this is affecting my nervous system. This yes. is something that's going on in my life that is meaningful that I need to pay attention to a little more. Yeah. And don't you, I mean, I, I thought it was only me who really resisted the idea that I had been in a trauma, even though now it's like, seems really obvious, but I did an event related to the book with a psychiatrist, Dr. Nina Basson. She's a psychiatrist out of Stanford. And um, she, somebody in the audience said, well, how do you know if you've been through a trauma or if you just had something sad happen to you? And she said something incredible. She told the whole audience, there were like 300 people there. She was like, everyone who's lived through this pandemic has been through a trauma. And just, you could hear it like a pin drop. And I get chills thinking about it. She was like, every single person, it has been, totally traumatic even if nobody you know has died even if you live in a state where things have been open most of the time it has been totally traumatizing and I just felt like oh thank god thank god like I just felt myself grateful we're having these national conversations because there were also there were other traumas in this past year but if we're just up front saying the pandemic gets everybody then we don't have to run so hard from the idea that we have experienced trauma. It's for everyone. <laughs> it's, it is. Yeah. Everyone experiences trauma. It's just, are we traumatized or not? And that depends on so many factors. And what I hear you say that makes me so happy when I hear people talking like this saying it's my nervous system, because one thing that I tell people all the time is that trauma isn't what happens to you. It's how your nervous system perceives what happens to you. And it puts you into that state of fight or flight, right? And if you're having these responses in your body, then your body's trying to tell you something or your body is in a state of arousal or maybe uh, hypo arousal and, you know, shutting down. And that is due to something. Yeah. And so exploring it. So I love that you meant, is that something you learned in therapy? I don't know. It's, I'm glad it's right. Cause I'm, I'm sure I say a lot of things that aren't right. I think that, I think I must've heard it in therapy. I must've heard Dr. Rosen. He can get very sciencey and most of it. I just don't absorb because I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor, but there's something about the description of trauma and nervous system that, that feels so real in me. I can almost picture my nerves just jangling. Like it really fits my own physiological experience of trauma and revisiting that and going to the beach or just loving. Loving on the back end of a trauma means you might have a goodbye down the road and my nervous system is like, ooh, I don't know. I don't know about that. So it feels real. And I think it probably was explained. Like he does lots of science things um, and that one hit. So it stayed with me. Yeah. I love that. What tools have you used or what has been, you know, helpful for you on your mental health journey that maybe our listeners can find useful and try to apply to their lives? Yeah. For me, it's just the number one thing is having people I can tell, like tell the secret tell the thing I'm scared of. Even if somebody has no interest in group therapy, um, do you have someone you could tell? You know, when you're, I, I know that experience of like something I'm like, oh, I'm not telling anyone this. And it kind of gives me this inner shakes a bit. If you could share that with one person who is going to be safe for you, whatever that means. And sometimes safety means they're just going to listen and hold it closely. Sometimes safety means they're going to challenge you or dialogue with you, whatever that means for you. But I would say having that support and those places to go so I don't have to be alone with my memories or my secrets, that's the number one thing. And I will say I, I do now meditate, um, but I people were telling me to meditate for about 30 years before I 
So it feels very advanced to me. Meditation feels like something people toss off and it kind of makes me like for years, I just want to like, just scream at people. Like, don't tell me to meditate. Like I'm too wound up to meditate. I see the benefits, but it feels like a very advanced thing um, to me. I mean, I certainly love therapy. I also love, you know, sometimes what I've noticed, like uh, Dr. Rosen sometimes goes out of town, like around the holidays, he was gone for three weeks. <laughs> and that's like, mm -hmm. if I'm totally dependent on therapy, which I'm probably as close to dependent on therapy as anyone I know, three weeks is a long time to try to do your life. If you're used to going, I usually go twice a week, right? And what I've noticed things that help getting some exercise, getting outside, taking a walk. Like it doesn't have to be like do 13 miles uphill, but like going on a walk and, or exercise and getting my blood flowing, that seems to help me regulate some of my runaway thoughts and some of my runaway emotions. It just helps perspective. For me, it's a great perspective giver to do exercise. And another thing is having developed some sense of my own self and my own pleasure of what I like. Like I now know I really love to take a walk and listen to a stimulating podcast. Like it doesn't have to be like when I used to think about self care, I'd be like, call the peninsula, get a 90 minute massage. And it was like, first of all, it takes hours. Secondly, it's a billions of dollars to do that. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, especially now in the pandemic, I've had to really find something much simpler. Like I'm not going to get a manicure. Um, and sometimes that just doesn't fit the bill, but like a really fun podcast and a walk or um, watching something on Netflix during the day. So it feels so decadent, like just a little, quick <laughs> damn it, just a little, like a nip of it. Uh, when I got my book deal, I was like, I think Dr. Rosen was out of town. And so it wasn't like I was going to be able to go to group and like celebrate and um, I just, I was bursting. So it wasn't like, I was not in crisis. I was super excited. This was like crazy what was happening. And my body was like doing that tremulous with joy. And I needed some kind of like equilibrium. And I just like took the afternoon off and I sat at my desk and I watched a marriage story. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I watched, mm -hmm. but I'm just not that happy. But um, I just like do something frivolous like do some, get off the treadmill. That's what my friend Debbie says, get mm -hmm. off the treadmill, the metaphoric hamster wheel of like, got to be productive. I should plan a meal. Maybe I'll run over to Trader Joe's and then the post office. Blah, blah, blah. I, you could do that for the rest. I could do that for the rest of my life, but to just step off and do a pleasure thing. That's good stuff mm -hmm. for a recovering perfectionist. Such good advice. Yeah. Such good advice. <laughs> Netflix during the day. <laughs> And all, I know, it's like so scandalous. It's the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's almost like the same advice that you were given in your eating disorder mm -hmm. recovery program, right? Just, just totally. relax. Totally, yeah. totally. Like I remember this woman, I was early in the program and I was like, what if I binge? What if I purge? What do I do at night? Because that was nights were tricky for me. That's when the feelings would come. That's when the eating would skid off the rails. And I'd say, what do I do? Dinner's over. There's no more food till the morning, but what do I do? And she would say, she said to me, sit on your bed. And I was like, and? And she was like, just sit on your bed. And I just thought that was like lunatic, lunatic lunacy, you know? And now I just think of that as the most, like, it's like a spiritual thing, like sit on your bed. And it's kind of like a slogan in my head. And it's not even just at night. Now, anytime when I'm just like frazzle dazzled, it's like, sit on your bed. And it, it calms me down. Just even think of that woman. She said that to me. It was 1996 when she said that to me. And I can still hear her voice in my head. It's like a spiritual thing to sit on your bed. You do no harm to yourself or others. Amazing. It's like, well, I don't know who said this quote. You guys have probably heard it. It's we are not human doings. We are human beings. Oh yeah. That's so good. And that's like, when you hear it for the first time, you're like, Oh yeah. Totally. I guess it just be <laughs> so amazing. Where can people find you? Sure. I am too scared of Twitter, but I am not scared of Instagram. <laughs> I'm brave enough for Instagram. I am on Instagram at Christy O Tate. And I have a website where I post um, new writing projects or whatever. That's 
christytate.com. My book is coming out in, it's in hardback now. The book group is coming out softback, I think in June. So it'll be cheaper if people are watching their pennies and take it to the beach. Maybe we can go to the beach this summer. Um, and I have been really enjoying interacting with um, readers or people who are curious or just talking about therapy. It's like, you, you have my ear if you want to talk about any of this. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to hear people's experience and certainly share my own, but definitely open for the conversation. Amazing. Well, thank you, Christy. I could have talked to you all day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you guys are so smart. You're doing such great work. I'm really grateful. Thanks for all everything you do for mental health and for people who are listening and relying on you. Thank you so much for chatting with us. Amazing. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, make sure to subscribe and leave a review. Join the Anxious Like You community by following at Anxious Like You on Instagram. See you in the next episode.